Should have stayed away. You should have killed me. I will. The decision to take on the retelling of Ben-Hur was something we all had to think very seriously about. It has worked as an epic book. It worked as a huge American theatrical production in the early 1900s. It was one of the great silent movies. Of course, one of the great movies ever in the hands of William Wyler. Ben-Hur is a wonderful and powerful story for the world in 2016. We're introduced to Judah and Masala. You see this deep love and understanding between these two brothers. But the pull of the empire destroys their relationship. I need you to tell me who I'm trying to meet, sir. Masala, I won't name names. Whatever happens now, you did this. Crucified. No! My family are taken away from me. I'm placed into the galley of a slave ship. It's been a mistake. My family, they're innocent. You won't see them again. Not in this life. How long were you a slave? Five years. What is your name? Judah ben -Hur. He's in real serious kill mode. I won't let Masala go unpunished for what he's done to us. There is a way. In the arena, there is no law. Defeat your brother, and you'll start a revolution to free us all. Ben-Hur is a completely unique story because of the collision of Ben-Hur and Masala. People would follow you. I would follow you. At the crucifixion of Jesus. Ben-Hur was a novel published in 1880 by General Lew Wallace, and I'm his great-great-granddaughter. He was a wonderful 19th century figure in American history, probably best known as a general in the Civil War. He wrote Ben-Hur over the course of four years, finished it in 1880, and bit by bit, Ben-Hur became a grassroots success. And here's how it happened. In those days, reading novels was widely considered to be a waste of time at the very best. What happened was that many of the preachers and pastors around the country read Ben-Hur, were enthralled by the story, and they recommended it to their parishioners. So all of a sudden, people in the heartland are being told to read a novel. The excitement, the thrill in this book was something they had never experienced. Ben-Hur came to me in a backwards kind of way. I was interested in finding a way to tell a story of forgiveness. I'm a huge admirer of Nelson Mandela. What he did in South Africa should be a model for the world. He created truth and reconciliation through the process of what ostensibly is forgiveness. So I was looking for a vehicle, if you like, to tell that story. I absolutely felt the need to read the book because whether there are elements that we are directly taking from Lou Wallace's novel or whether there are other elements that we're bringing in through original creation, I think it's very important to understand the emotional velocity of that original writer. You have to understand where you're beginning to try to formulate a plan of where you're going. We're not family, are we? Are we? We're just a lowly orphan your family took in. The idea of these two brothers, so to speak. One was Roman, one was Jew. Grew up together, one betrayed the other. You have uprising, you have the repression. You have nations that are not about forgiving. All they want is freedom. And at what cost? If they have their way, they'll bring the whole of Rome down on us. Then when will our freedom be? There's freedom elsewhere. In that scene, we have Jesus the carpenter, the quintessential master builder. Love your enemies. That's very progressive. I love the response. That sounds very progressive indeed. God is love. It speaks to 1 Peter chapter 2, the fact that Christ is continuously building a spiritual house. And where will your love be when the Romans turn their anger on the rest of us? Hate and fear are lies that turn us against each other. The answer to radical hatred is radical love, love for God and love for one another. He has a path planned for you. 
If he has a path plan for me, how am I better off than a slave? Why don't you ask her? Okay, good. I said no. First thing, I said no, I'm not interested to make this movie. And Sean Daniel, he said, I understand, but maybe just read the script, please. And I read the script and suddenly I understood this movie I must make. Timor's vision was all-encompassing. He drew on history and imagery and deep, deep research of the times, ways that people really lived. The idea was to create a very authentic world. Everything is real, the texture, the acting, the dialogues, very grounded. But the way how we shoot it should be very contemporary. How the camera works, like a losing focus. Not just to show the audience that world, how to be there. This was how we made this movie. Dangerous territory. Pirates and marauders. What are you? The one not in chains. When you do a remake, you just do note for note. Now we're doing a reimagining, which means that the story is still there and all of its beats and stuff, but I'm in it. Start there. I'm African. I'm not a shank. I still have all the accoutrements. I'm still a big gambler. I'm betting that my driver will be victorious over Masala. You've crushed an entire people. I should think crushing one man wouldn't be difficult. All right, so down, please. Okay. Ready, action. Bring in an actor like Morgan Freeman, someone of his stature, who has performed in so many different places and so many different spaces. That alone is a reason to go back and to recreate this story. The world you live in is Rome's. You cannot fight them in the streets. Our mother and sister, was it a quick death? Out. At this point in the story, Ben-Hur injures Masala, and then, at Pilate's order, because a Roman soldier has been attacked. What's the value of a Jew to a Roman? 20, I would say. <laughs> Have you seen the 20 they have crucified? You did that. Look, if people are dead, that's on Rome. You tried to kill Masala. I told you to stay away from him, Judah. I warned you. I won't let him go and punish what he's done to us. She has found the way of peace and the way of serving others, and he hasn't caught up with her yet. There's nothing here for you anymore. Nothing. It's really heartbreaking in a way because this is the woman that he chose so many years ago to marry, and yet he's willing to let love go and choose hate. The female voice is definitely not lost in this very testosterone-heavy story. It has a very significant presence. It was important that we have strong female characters. Ayelet and Sophie are beautiful in these roles. I was like, okay, if Timo's making it, then this could be interesting. And then we hopped on a Skype conversation. We talked about everything. Women's roles and writing and drama and camera, everything. And I realized it would be really creative working with him and I was not wrong. Teresa, could you help me to my bedroom, please? What stood out to me about this version was that these women matter, and they have a great effect on the men around them. You spent too much idle time with Masala. If I didn't, you'd have nothing to complain about. We live in a pretty hopeless times right now. I talk to people all the time who have lost hope. They've lost hope in themselves, They've lost hope in their marriage. They've lost hope in their friendships or their career. For a good portion of Judah Ben-Hur's life, everything goes wrong. He goes from being a prince of Israel to the worst of the slaves in a slave ship. If this ship goes down, so do you. And yet Judah Ben-Hur never gives up. I love the part in the slave ship where he goes, man, just survive. If you, please, no. ah! Don't, just survive. Some people are going to watch this movie who are in survival mode right now. There's nothing wrong with that. When you're going through hell, you keep going. And no! Jesus of Nazareth, in the name of Caesar! 
Officer, you are under arrest. It was absolutely very important for us to embrace the aspects of faith in this story. Those who live by the sword will die by the sword. And certainly having individuals like Mark and Roma on board, who it's such an important part of their lives, to be able to guide us, to be able to make sure that the things that we're saying are true to scripture, are true to faith. In our film, we felt it was very important not just to see the face of Jesus, but to feel the heart of Jesus and to hear the words of Jesus. It's through his encounter with Jesus that Judah Ben-Hur has a transformation that changes his life forever. How do you prepare to play Jesus Christ? That is the question. How do you do this? I grew up in Brazil, a very Catholic country. My grandma is actually Italian and very Christian, and I grew up hearing stories about Jesus. When you see the love inside of everyone, and you set aside the hate... It's a gigantic responsibility, but also an absolutely unique opportunity just to have a chance to explore and to have a deeper understanding of what he went through and try to practice his teachings. One of the many layers of lessons in this movie is the challenge to position yourself intentionally to serve, to help, to bless someone else. He could have easily stood on the sideline like everyone else. I mean, he doesn't have leprosy, so why should he relate to that? But he's moved with compassion. I love that phrase in scripture. He's moved with compassion. How willing are we to identify with those who are not like us, ethnically, racially, uh, dare I even say sexually? Hate, anger, fear, those are lies they used to turn you against each other. Love is our true nature. Here's an example of a man who seems to cross lines to stand with someone, to encourage someone, to bless someone. And at the end of the day, that's really the essence of ministry. Not my words, Miss Ella. This Jesus of Nazareth is more dangerous than all of the Sedits combined. Here we are in southern Italy in the beautiful town of Matera. Directly behind me is the Her Mansion where the family live, a beautiful, beautiful villa. We'll be shooting the exterior of this mansion here in Matera. Matera is south of Rome, five hours by car. The cornerstone had to be the Ben-Hur exterior. The house that we found is at the top of the hill on the top of a very long flight of stairs. And that was a perfect place for the family to watch the Roman soldiers invading. Oh, have mercy on me, world. Not one of my 359 gods will smile upon me. Don't mock. The palace, it's based on a model of a house in Pompeii, a wealthy person's house. There's no red, because that's Roman. There's gold, blue, and white. So it's meant to look much more Hebrew. Right now, we are in the palace. Many, many rooms inside, outside. There's great details in it, on the floor. I went here in Rome to see a tour about mosaic paintings. And the next day, we came here to filmed the first time and I was shocked it was the same. Everything is quite remarkable. It's also got a lot of live rock showing in the walls. The house is meant to look like it's carved partly out of the hill and partly constructed the same way the circus is supposed to look like it's carved out of the hill below Matera and partly constructed from the excavated rock. It's good. I like how it looks. Nah. We can put some vaseline or something okay. to make it dark if it will be too much. Too much. Yeah, but for now it's okay. okay no, Varia, who is married to Timor, she's been a wonderful person to work with. She's brought a few key people with her, but like 90% of her crew is Italian, and they've just done a great job. My idea about Judah was to walk the audience through his story and to make the audience feel how he is growing up, how he is changing. Because in the beginning, we see him in the palace, and he is kind of a spoiled, princy, very light, very colorful person. But as soon as he comes back from the slavery, I made his colors more darker, he is more heavy, he is more closed. You think that he's grown up now. 
Misal, it was the same idea to show him growing up, becoming more stronger and more tough, and to come with him to the end of the story. Varya has found people who are very conscious of how difficult it is to wear leather and metal caresses, and they've made them as comfortable as possible. I wore a leather tunic for uh, Purim, the big party. <laughs> And that's about six hours of jumping around and pretending to be dancing at a party in a room with no air. That was actually the hardest bit. It was exhausting. My calf still hurt. <laughs> it's still killing me. centerpiece is the chariot race. We had to find a way to do our own version of this terrifying, awesome, death-defying event. The chariot race would have been shot over 33 separate days of filming. It's grounded and it's very real. Everything is very visceral. By putting the camera like a GoPro in the corner of the chariot, the action becomes real immediately because the camera is just witnessing, it creates its own style. The first time on the chariot, you're rather nervous and thinking, OK, right, we're actually about to shoot this. Very quickly, you settle into it. It became almost like another day at work, which was sort of an amazing thing, because when is that going to be another day at work? <laughs> we are really doing this at speed. You go on the ride with the actors in this thing. It's scary. There is no airbags. There is no brakes. It's like today's NASCAR. People enjoying the speed, the tension, and most of all, when somebody will crash. I was very proud of how dedicated everyone was to safety and to taking care of the animals. We actually work under a very strict set of guidelines put forward by the American Humane Association. For that reason, no harm was done to these horses. Come on, Masala! Actually relying on these creatures surrounded by and other people doing the same thing. It's one of the most exhilarating adrenaline rushes you'll ever experience in your life. The outcome of the race is a very surprising difference for anybody who has seen the original. Are we having fun now, brother? There are these two beautiful complimentary moments in the film. Hold! On your feet! There's a moment where Jesus is in a position to help Judah. Thank you. You do the same. Long before Judah knows who Jesus is, Jesus is actually speaking into his life, saying there's a goodness in you that you are unaware of. There's a potential capacity that you've not owned yet. Later, when Jesus is being driven to the cross, Judah is there to defend Jesus. No water for him. Please drink. No water for him! And in his mind, if you want to protect the people you love, this is what you do. And Jesus stops him. No. And he says, my life. I give it of my own free will. That was a moment for me that just, just tore me apart. Even when it seemed that Jesus was powerless, he was choosing to give his life on our behalf. Today we're filming the crucifixion. You can see behind me here on the hillside, everybody's getting set up for that. The scene is arguably the center of the film. It's the heart and soul of the movie. We're talking about a single event that changed civilization. The night before, I called Roma, and I'm like, let's talk a little bit about this, please. And I was sharing with her thoughts and feelings that I had about it, and she stopped and I said, Rodrigo, there is no right way of doing this. Just commit to it and do it with your full heart.
just witnessing something like that, your mind goes back to this happened. The emotions were right there. It's not something that you even have to really conjure up much effort to portray. When we finished shooting and when they took me off the cross, my body was involuntarily shaking. I couldn't stop shaking. It was the, probably the most emotionally charged experience that I've ever had. The crucifixion is what makes this movie meaningful. This movie will confront you, challenge you. This film's a source of inspiration for me. As two people move toward Jesus, they actually find each other. Instead of condemning and being depressed about the darkness, hate and anguish and violence and anger, why not turn on the light? We move forward not by retaliation, but through mercy. Everybody's very excited to be in this. I'm a great chariot race specialist, and I have to tell you, it was so compelling, you can't take your eyes off of it. This movie is a movie for everyone. This is an epic in every sense of the word.